Welcome to season six of the Florida Institute for Child Welfare podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lisa Magruder. This season, we will hear from researchers, advocates, and folks with lived experience in child welfare. Through these conversations, we hope to gain insight on how to meaningfully co-create knowledge alongside those we aim to serve here at the Institute, children, families, and workers. Let's get started. Today, we're joined by Pascal Wen, parent knowledge curator at Mining for Gold and a mother with lived expertise of the child welfare system. Yes, I'm excited to be here. I hope that I can bring some new information to the table. We're also joined by Dr. Peter Pecora, Managing Director of Research Services with Casey Family Programs and Professor of Social Work at the University of Washington. Good to be here with you this morning. And finally, also from Casey Family Programs, Strategic Consultant Jess Hannett Coulter is with us today. Thank you so much for having us. We look forward to this conversation. Great. So Peter, I wanted to start with you. Can you give us just a brief history lesson on child welfare research? So specifically, how do we know what we know up until this point? Be happy to. Research in child welfare began in the early 1900s with a focus on the use of child labor by the founding mothers of social work, who were Grace Abbott and Julia Lathrop. Grace and Julia use that research data to get the gathered up to advocate for changes in the child labor laws. And then if you fast forward a bit in the late 1950s, journalists and researchers were documenting the plight of children languishing in long-term foster care when there was very little effort to reunify them with parents or find relatives to care for them or to help get them adopted. And a good example of that was in 1959, Henry Moss and Richard Engler published a classic book called Children in Need of Parents. And it was a national foster care study that was sponsored by the Child Welfare League of America. And among its most significant findings was that a community's foster care system reflects the culture and the values and the demographics and the political beliefs and the views about family and children. And that, in a sense, the agencies that work in our communities are a reflection of us as citizens and as a community, and that communities really needed to get involved to help care for those children. And about that same time, specifically in 1962, there was another landmark study, but this one was done by a pediatric radiologist. And Dr. Steele, he was one of the first to document particular child injuries spiral fractures being one of them, that were due to child abuse. So that piece of research was a major piece of research sort of underpinning the science of diagnosing child abuse. And then from the 1980s onward, research in child welfare has increased pretty dramatically. And can you tell us a little bit more about how data are collected and used today? As public child welfare data systems like the adoption and foster care analysis reporting system, what some people call AFCARS, as that and some of the child abuse and neglect reporting systems have grown, they're now being used more effectively as the data elements have been refined. And that's provided an opportunity for communities as well as professionals to use that kind of data for planning. Now, the point here though, is the data must be used properly. And by that, I mean, what we're learning is it's very important to examine that data with respect to age, gender, race or ethnicity, sexual identity, and other dimensions. Because what you've got to find out is where is the system really succeeding with certain groups of children or families? And where is the system need extra support to improve its performance. And you can't do that unless you analyze your data by various subgroups. So these kinds of management information systems bolstered by special research studies have really helped us know more about why families become involved in child welfare. These management information systems along with these special research studies have helped us know more about why families become involved in child welfare and what can be done to prevent that or serve those children and families that need child welfare services. So if done well, 
Science can help us in many ways. For example, a communications firm is called Frameworks recently underscored that science helps us in three ways. Science unlocks mysteries. Science is practical in that it creates helpful and useful ideas. And scientific studies can help us solve problems. So these were all three very practical ways that research and building science and practice science can really help us. But the big but here is that we need to be careful, though, when we're doing our scientific studies, that we are including the communities that are affected or involved in those studies and people with lived expertise in that area, because those folks can help us frame up the research questions and help us figure out how best to gather the data. And then they can help us interpret or make sense of the data that we do gather. Research has to be done in a certain way, we believe, for it to have maximum value and impact. Part of that that you've just touched on is this idea of including those with lived expertise on research studies in evaluations that we conduct around child welfare work. So Pascal, I wanted to turn to you. You've been very active in sharing your lived expertise of child welfare in a number of ways, public speaking, training, national network membership. How did you get connected to these organizations? There's many ways to get connected, but the way that I was, it was uh, through focus groups held by national organizations like the Youth Law Center and Casey Family Programs, and also within my state, the Department of Children and Family Services. I was invited to be in a focus group in 2016 with the Quality Parent Initiative. I was very interested in being a part of something to help the system <laughs> because my experience with the system as a consumer was not that great. So I was very eager to show up at these focus groups and speaking events and like happy to be a part of it. And so that's how I started on this journey of public speaking and being part of system change. And what was the initial experience like of sharing your story in this way? And has that changed over time? My first experience with the focus group, that was with the QPI director of DCFS. It was very organized, prepared. We were compensated. We were fed. And so having all those components together made it very inviting. <laughs> I would say I felt very valued at that speaking engagement. And then there was another piece too with like my local area being on a parent advisory council within a smaller organization, but it was so rigid and we couldn't expand it any more than what the organization wanted from us. Like I wasn't given the opportunity to help the parent advisory council grow, which I'm pretty sure I could have. And so like they limited us that have lived experience when we were put on that board with those two experiences. It's just, for me, it shows like their lack of knowledge of what we bring to the table versus the national organizations understanding the value that we have inside and that what we can bring and the changes that we can help make and improve the system. So it sounds like in those initial collaborations that you had, when they compensated you for your time and they showed their appreciation for you being there and you really had equal power and partnership at that table to help affect change, that that was meaningful for you. But in some of your other experiences where perhaps your voice was not utilized to the degree that it could have been, or you and your fellow folks with lived expertise, fellow parents, weren't able to truly make change. Definitely. <laughs> That's exactly what I was explaining. <laughs> and so in terms of these collaborations, like you said, you mentioned the compensation, you mentioned just a general inviting atmosphere, providing food, right? Those types of things. Are there other things in collaborations that you feel have been successful when advocating for change and partnering with national organizations, researchers, evaluators, are there things that have made you feel valued? Yes, definitely. So those pieces you just spoke about are some very important go-to start off collaborating with people with lived experience and lived expertise recommendations I would suggest using <laughs> to start off with. I know the value piece for me has always been in feeling the vibes from the others in whatever space that I'm in. These are the things I think about is like, 
Were they informative about why they wanted me there and what I could bring to the research or work? And another question is, did they invite me for my skills and did they include me through the entire process, not just one piece? And I can say this for most of my collaborations, I have been and felt very valued. And so the ones where I don't is where I've been and I have had this experience too in the beginning too, is where I like I was brought to the table information was extracted from me from some very dark places in my lifetime I mean my children's as well and then that information later on I find out turns into this big initiative where these organizations are making millions of dollars and I'm like okay well I'm glad that it's helping change the system right however I felt I didn't like it ended there for me I was no longer involved in anything from that point then I just find out years later, it turned into this big old thing. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful for that. However, I just felt like I wish I could have, you know, because something that they took from me as part of their principles and their program and their initiative, I wish I could have been more involved in it. And so I wasn't, and that didn't make me feel very valued. Yeah. So it sounds like them taking your story and making it their story essentially without your involvement. Basically. I enjoy whenever I'm able, like I've been with Casey for a couple of years now (laughs) on a project, CPS Removal Reductions in Poverty. And so it's been, it's been eye-opening for me. It's been very fulfilling. I've gained knowledge and I've gained skills and like different ways of like sharing my story without sharing my story. And that's from the experience from Casey Family Programs and also my new role with Mining for Gold. (laughs) I've really enjoyed being part of the entire process. And I think that if you want to get more folks on board to basically make sure that they're included in every step of the way and Casey Family Programs has made sure that I'm included in every single thing. They let me know about everything. We have biweekly meetings. We chit chat about like, our lives, just normal conversation. It just helps, you know, it helps a lot whenever you can connect in a way that isn't just about work. It changes the whole, the whole dimension of everything. It really does. Well, and kind of helps create that sense of you're really a team, right? Reducing those power differentials. We're all humans. We're all on this team together. We all have our own unique stories and can build rapport with each other in that way. That's great. So I'd like to pose a question to all of you. So anyone jump in, what are some of the challenges that occur in research and evaluation work within child welfare when attempting to engage parents and youth in their work? Yeah, thanks for that question, Lisa. I think one of the things that we can get caught up in is tokenizing our people with lived experience. And we get wrapped up in just meeting those demands or those checklists. And instead, really what Pascal was describing is this true partnership, this true relationship that really does come together, share power, and talk about how the roles of each other and how together we can make it even better than one of us independently. And we really need to be prepared for the time that it takes, as Pascal mentioned, those biweekly meetings and ensuring that you budget for that and that you pay your experts, your experts with lived experience all along the way and not just for the moment of the gathering of information, but how they're a partner and true co-design and true development together in really networking in a different way, as Pascal mentioned, deeper relationships instead of just about the work, but how might we really come together and see each other as humans and work together to solve this very difficult problem. The other thing we have to recognize is a lot of communities have been researched over the years, and there is a lot of mistrust within many of those communities and communities of color and the relationship wasn't there in those prior engagements. And it was just about what Pascal said, what can I get or take from you and use over here? And instead, take the time to really come alongside, have real conversations, and really work together to co-design the study, co-design even the questions, even the order of the questions in which they should be asked of community members, whether it's in a focus group 
or a survey, wherever it is, you really come together with those who you are seeking the information from and have them come alongside you throughout the entire process and share all of the power, as you said, Lisa, to really make this a new way of doing research. I'm going to go back to the tokenism piece. It's funny. I felt like I was being protected from hearing that word for many, many years <laughs> as a person with lived experience. As a matter of fact, I didn't hear the word tokenism never in my life until I got a position with the Capacity Building Center for States as a family consultant. And then they introduced me to Hearts Ladder. And I'm just like, all these feelings came inside of me. And I was like, what, what is this? Like this, I've been let me, for better words, pimped out, right? Like that's how I felt. Like I was being a parent that was pimped out, right? But that's just like the raw truth about it. And then it got very overwhelming for me. But then I remembered like, let me not forget why I showed up, right? And the reason I showed up was because my heart was there, my mind and like the meaning of changing, not only the system, but changing myself too, because, you know, I'm in recovery and part of the work that I do is about recovery. <laughs> and so it's really healed me a lot. And so I always have to go back to that piece. Like, even though I feel like it's kind of hard to not do that, we got to start somewhere, right? People with lived experience start somewhere and then it turns into lived expertise after you get some skills and more knowledge. And so another thing that I really felt tokenized and specifically this article that I typed up and I wrote with this organization and then it was published as I was the writer, which is great. But then when I read it, so many things were put in there that I didn't even say. And I was just like, oh my gosh, you know, like, why would they do that? It made me realize that's the piece, the tokenization piece where you do that to families and children, and then you change it around for your game, right? It causes distrust. I know that I future reference. I can say no to opportunities. I don't say no to Casey because <laughs> they already, they work with me like that. So I know the expectations with Casey. I don't have to worry about that, but any new places, I'm very funny about it. I'm like, uh, I can say no. Absolutely. And that sounds like a testament to the rapport building that we were talking about earlier, that once you have an opportunity to get to know the folks that you're working with beyond just the confines of being on a research study together or something, right? I think that that makes a huge difference. And I also hear you talking a lot about autonomy for our folks with lived expertise and lived experience, this idea that you have the autonomy and the decision-making authority to say yes or no, including having that final authority over your own story and how that's shared. Yes, definitely. So we heard from Pascal around some of the things that were really helpful in getting her foot in the door on some of these collaborations, right? This idea of creating a welcoming environment, joining some local and some national groups. Jess and Peter, I'm curious for researchers who are interested in doing more of this work and meaningfully engaging folks with lived expertise. Do you have any suggestions for how to connect with folks like Pascal, who maybe their expertise is going untapped and they're interested in participating with researchers and evaluators in this way? I think some of the things we'll talk about in terms of these best practices are really going to reinforce what Pascal just mentioned. And I think they would apply to youth, young adults, and to parents who have had some involvement in the child welfare system. And the reason why I say that is one of the first things that came to mind as we were talking about this the other day was that when we're engaging people with lived expertise in a potential collaboration, you've got to build a trusted relationship and you've got to take the time also to do the necessary orientation to the research project. And by that, I mean, you've got to explain some of the technical processes. If someone says, well, we're forming up research questions. Well, what does that mean? What is a research question and why is it important in an evaluation study? And we've got to explain some of the terms. Is it a quasi-experimental design? Well, what does that mean? And what is a comparison group and how are we going to form one? These are some of the nuts and bolts that are part of a research endeavor, but they're not terms and concepts the everyday citizen knows about. So you've got to take that time to both orient and to build that relationship and trust. And then you've got to help the person with lived expertise 
become clear, as you heard Pascal, what is the role that they're being asked to play? In this case, a lot of times it's either part of an advisory committee, or maybe they might be serving as an ongoing member of a project team. But what what's involved with that? What does that mean? What's the time commitment so that that person can realistically say, is this going to be feasible for me with my other commitments that I have going on in my life? So those are some of the nuts and bolts that are really important that sometimes get overlooked. And then you hear Pascal and other folks saying, you know, they skipped a step or they didn't really pay any attention to that at all. And there I am in an advisory committee meeting, and I don't quite know what my role is in that meeting. And that makes for some pretty awkward moments. A second piece that's connected to that is rapport building and communication. So again, another way of coming at this is to say, hey, to do this well, you've got to hold regular check-ins. And the check-ins have at least two areas of focus. So every few weeks, one of our colleagues pulls together our people with lived expertise that we're working on across all of research services at Casey Family Programs. And how do you structure those check-ins? We sit and talk, and we talk about two things. The research project itself, just touching base and seeing if there are any questions about that. But we're also talking about the process. How are things going? Do people feel like we're communicating well? Are we all on the same page about where we're at in the project? Because the project that Pascal was talking about, we're in sort of a lull right now because we're waiting for the results to be published in a journal article. We're waiting when that journal article is published, we're going to schedule some new speaking engagements, which means our two experts with lived expertise in child welfare, we're all going to be on deck again to make some presentations. But for the last, I don't know, Pasquale, probably six months, we've been waiting for that research team to sort of finish up the report, get it into a journal. And so projects have ebbs and flows. And we all have to be on the same page about that. So that's the part about the regular communication. That's such an important point about the ebb and flow of research projects, because I think that's another research specific process that folks who don't do this for a living may not know. We have busy times and slow times, depending on what phase of the project we're in at any given time. So your collaborators, in this case, those with lived experience, might be quietly wondering when they'll hear from you next if you're in a slow phase and don't hold these regular check-ins. So any other advice for the research community? I'm just going to reinforce what Baskin mentioned, which is people with lived expertise need to be compensated adequately. And that means the funders, whether it's a foundation, state, county, whoever, they've got to make sure that the project team has adequate funding to pay for the time that it takes to build rapport with the community and to orient the people with loved expertise so that the project can really launch in a really good way. And that takes time and people should be paid for their time. And then sometimes what funders don't think about maybe as much as they should is that you've got to allow some dollars for the end of the project because that in some respects is the most important phase. You've done all this work to collect the data. You don't want to shortchange the community, the project team, the people who lived expertise because they deserve to be supported in taking those findings out into the community and to policymakers And that takes time and money. And those research teams deserve that kind of support instead of having the project sort of end suddenly. And all that work really isn't built on and used to the full extent. So those are a couple things that we mentioned here and we wanted to reinforce. I think Jess has got something she might want to add. Thanks, Dr. Pecora. I think one of the things that we need to consider is as researchers or as those in system professional positions is the willingness to be vulnerable. We often think we have all the answers. We think we know where this research project should go. And I say should on purpose. And instead, how might we really pause and bring along the community, build relationships, true relationships, and be willing to look at ourselves in this space and not just the object of the research components and be willing to really look deep and partner with people 
experts who have a completely different perspective than we do. And Dr. Pakora mentioned the appropriate compensation. And I think that needs to be something we really look at and be willing to, as Dr. Pakora said, budget from the very beginning and throughout the entire work. And to Dr. Pakora's point, the dissemination. What is this research actually telling all of us? And what might we do as a result of that? I think really partnering in a different way and being willing to look at ourselves as professionals and be vulnerable in this space. And through that vulnerability, relationship and trust building can occur. Even though Dr. Pakora was talking about sometimes it's a little slow in our research and our stuff that we're doing, in the middle of that, the connections and the relationships I've made, more opportunities have come now. Casey assigned me to Alabama Community of Hope Project, right? And then actually a lot of the experience I've had with Casey, I used to apply for a position with the governor in my state and I was picked. I'm a commission council in my state. And like all of this, it just shows what happens when we invest in our folks with lived experience. It's like limitless opportunities for us to grow and show up in different arenas. Like the council I'm on in my state, I'm the only person that has any of the past that I have that's at that table. I bring a different dynamic. I bring children and families to the table. They don't talk about that often. And I get to use some of the research information I've gotten from the stuff I'm on. Part of like, hey, what about this? And okay, what about black and brown families? And what about this can happen? And then we're in poverty and then boom, our kids are removed because we're struggling with paying for things, right? And I'm utilizing what y'all have given me and giving back to the people in my own community, which they would have never even thought about doing because they don't invest. <laughs> and that's the problem. If you don't invest, you're not going to get anything. Like you have to invest. You have to invest in yourself. You have to invest in your community. You have to invest in people that you bring to the table. Investment and compensation is very important. Yeah. Lisa, if I could add to what Pascal just shared there, I think it's important to recognize that our people with lived expertise have much more to offer than, quote, just their story. They have so many additional insights and expertise beyond just telling their story. So invite those experts to the table early, during, after, and throughout, because you will be changed as a result of those relationships. I can attest to being changed by some of those experts in the state of Florida, that this is an opportunity to really look at this world and this work completely differently. So bring them to the table for more than their story. Bring them to the table for their expertise. Support them in additional opportunities, as Pascal mentioned. I love that. And Pascal, you were really talking about quite a powerful platform that you have, several powerful platforms that you have to share your gifts with the world, both as Jess said, in terms of yes, your story, but also the unique skills that you bring just as an individual to the table. And I think that's what I love about when we're talking about these research partnerships, really recognizing the unique skills and talents of each of the members of the team and having mutual respect for those gifts that we're all bringing to the table so that we can produce the best work that we can. So I am very excited to hear about all the ways that you've been able to take what you've even learned from these experiences and translating those into some of your own autonomous initiatives, right? You mentioned that you're starting your own nonprofit and you're on a governor's task force. So those things are very exciting. Pascal, as we close out, I'm curious to hear from you. We've talked a lot about ways in which we can loop in the expertise and the experiences of parents and youth and young adults, those with lived experiences and expertise into our research and evaluation in a meaningful way. So for you as a parent who's been engaging in this work, what is the number one thing that you'd like child welfare researchers to know about collaborating with children and families with lived expertise? We're an investment that cannot be taught in a university or in a textbook. You can't get this from anything but us. And so we bring so much more to the table than just our story. And for me personally, 
some very painful experiences in my life that I've climbed out of that I never want to go back to. So I hold some principles within me, right? Some very strong when I stand on my principles. I would say to continue to value and invest in families, invest your love, your time, your resources, ask for outside help. (laughs) Just don't give up and to continue creating brave spaces for opportunities. And this is more than one thing, but (laughs) it's less than the million of things that I could have shared. I'd like to thank all of our guests for sharing their knowledge and experiences with us today. If you're interested in learning more about this episode and our guests, please visit our website at www.ficw.fsu.edu. You can also follow the Institute on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn at FSU Child Welfare. Thank you to our executive producer, Mariana Tutwiler, our assistant director of communications, Emily Joyce, and our audio engineer and editor, Izzy Craig. And finally, thanks to all of you for tuning in today. I'm Dr. Lisa Magruder for the Florida Institute for Child Welfare.